Gibraltar, this massive limestone rock commanding the strait between two continents, Africa and Europe, and between the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, is a very special place. This narrow rocky peninsula has an importance that far outweighs its size. Fought over for centuries, this natural bastion has long been considered a little bit of England. But although the police may dress like the traditional British bobby, you can enjoy afternoon tea in a gracious hotel lounge and fish and chips on the seafront, Gibraltar is simply proud to be itself. And today, the rock is a magnet for visitors who want to see the remainders of her turbulent and fascinating past, but who also come to study her unique flora and fauna, meet the world-famous apes, shop until they drop, and then relax on the sandy beaches or play at the casino tables. Her importance still far outweighs her size. Less than six square kilometres, and Britain's last colony in Europe, in times gone by it was her most important asset. Some even say without Gibraltar to act as garrison port to Nelson, the British could have lost the Battle of Trafalgar, allowing England to become merely a part of France. As guardian of a 13 kilometre seaway at the entrance to the Mediterranean, the rock's strategic importance has been acknowledged since before Roman times. Soldiers have fought for her, politicians argued over her, and citizens from all around the world have made her their own. No other place has witnessed so much history. As the prize in the tug of war, first between the Moroccans and Spanish, and later the Spanish and British, she survived 15 sieges, the last only 10 years ago. Her mighty rock has been honeycombed with tunnels for gun emplacements and military installations. As a task force headquarters in the Second World War, she was a target for enemy raids, and her dockyards were called into action once again during the Falklands War. Remnants of past civilizations and skirmishes surround you in her winding streets and are scattered over and inside the awe-inspiring rock. This 1,500 billion tons of limestone was laid down under the sea in the Jurassic period, over 180 million years ago when large dinosaurs roamed the planet and was pushed up above sea level as the earth cooled. Because limestone slowly dissolves under the action of water, natural caves have been formed inside the rock. Over 140 at last count, but there are still many more to be discovered. The rock was once firmly attached to the African continent, and although Greek mythology will tell you their hero Hercules forced the mountains of Mons Calpe and Mons Abila apart so he could have an easier passage through to Cadiz, it seems more likely that violent earth movements five million years ago opened the gap, letting the Atlantic rush in to fill the dry Mediterranean basin. Because Gibraltar stands at the narrowest sea crossing between two continents, it's on the flight path south for thousands of migrating birds. If you stood on the rock long enough, especially at Jews Gate or the cable car station, you could spot almost three quarters of Europe's birds. Only around 15 species of them actually nest on the rock, but that includes the Barbary partridges, the only ones found outside Africa. As eagles, buzzards and storks come in close to the rock, to use its air currents and updrafts to gain height for their sea crossing, beneath them is a carpet of more than 600 different varieties of wild flowers. Some, like the Gibraltar candy tuft, are unique to the rock, and even rare orchids flourish here. Recently, the Alameda Gardens, a sanctuary away from the bustle of town, have been restored to their former glory with magnificent trees, shrubs and plants from around the world. Roaming far above the gardens are the rock's most famous inhabitants, the Barbary apes, the only free-ranging monkeys in Europe. These Macaca sylvanus are tailless but definitely monkeys, as any unsuspecting tourist who's had his spectacles or sandwiches snatched will tell you. They live in three packs. One group is easily spotted at the ape's den at Queen's Gate, while the others at Rook Battery and Princess Caroline's Battery are completely wild. Arriving, so the story goes, from Africa via a tunnel under the strait, they enter the rock at St. Michael's Cave. Or, more probably, 
were brought across the sea 250 years ago by the Moorish invaders, or later still by English soldiers. The rough limestone and scrub were to their liking, and here they stayed, becoming so popular as pets in the 18th century that a tax was imposed on their owners. Strangely, they've never spread across the narrow border to Spain, preferring to remain constant to the rock. But by the Second World War, the colony was dying out, and this was a major problem for Winston Churchill, who obviously believed the tale that when the last ape left Gibraltar, it would mark the end of British sovereignty. He rushed two dozen of them out to the rock and saved the day. Ownership of the rock has long been a point of contention. A trip through Gibraltar's unique museum details the struggles that have kept the rock on the forefront of history. But one of the first displays shows a prehistoric remain that could have made Gibraltar a household word. The Gibraltar skull was discovered in 1848, but its importance was not recognized until 16 years later, by which time a skull from Neander in Germany had been heralded as the first example of remains from a creature linking man to ape. So, our predecessors could have been known as Gibraltar man instead of Neanderthal. Or, more correctly, Gibraltar woman, as the rock skull was female. Inhabited from the earliest time, Gibraltar didn't feature prominently in history until 711 AD, when the Muslims used the peninsula as a stepping stone for the conquest of Christian Spain. Crossing the strait from North Africa, the Moors snatched the rock, and from there went on spreading their religion further north for 400 years, reaching almost as far as Paris. For them, the rock was of strategic importance, as the keystone to the rest of the continent. And the victorious general is remembered in today's Gibraltar, whose name is a corruption of Jebel Tariq, or the Mountain of Tariq. For the next 800 years, Christians fought Muslims throughout Spain. Although Tariq built some fortifications, still called the Wall of the Arabs, Gibraltar didn't begin to flourish as a town until 1160, when the Sultan of Morocco, Abd al-Mumin, began building the first city on the rock in the area down from the present Moorish castle and as far as Casemate Square. Further south, there was a Muslim shrine near Europa Point, and a fine underground reservoir and the Moorish baths under the present museum possibly date from this time. The Sultan needed his fortifications, like this lookout tower, because his side had been weakened and split into factions, and the Christian reconquest of Spain was well underway. But it was nearly 200 years before the Spanish mounted their attack. The town on the rock had grown, but the fortifications were probably weak, and it took only one month for the Moorish inhabitants to hand over to the conquering Castilians. And so the tug of war began. The Moors left, the Spanish moved in. Then 24 years later, in 1333, another successful siege, and the rock returned to the Moors. During this time, in an attempt to strengthen defences, the present tower of the Moorish castle, which dominates town, was built. King Alfonso XI was devastated at his loss, and so began his country's obsession with the capture and ownership of Gibraltar. But despite more sieges and attacks, she didn't land back in Spanish hands until 1462. Then followed internal bickerings between various dukes over ownership, until Queen Isabella, after her glorious victory in Granada over the Moors in 1492, followed by an invasion of North Africa launched from Gibraltar, insisted the rock come under the crown itself. In 1502, Isabella gave the city of Gibraltar its red and white arms, showing a castle and key, still in use today. The design portrays her insistence that the rock was the key to her kingdoms. And two years later, in her will, she charged all her successors to keep Gibraltar in their possession, a responsibility still taken seriously by some of her countrymen today. The rock, in fact, remained Spanish for almost 250 years, although despite the early enthusiasm, was soon neglected by the conquerors busy with Columbus's fantastic discovery of the Americas. Gibraltar was given over to religious pursuits. The old Moorish mosque was converted to a Christian church. A friary, later to become the convent, and now the governor's residence, was built. 
and energy was spent keeping out the pirates launching raids from across the strait. But slowly, interest in the strange peninsula began to grow far away in England. Cromwell, victor of the Civil War, considered her a fine fortress and base. But it wasn't until the reign of Protestant Queen Anne that England had the opportunity for taking the rock. Even then, England only sent forces under Admiral Sir George Rook to help the Archduke Charles of Austria, who England supported as the rightful heir to the disputed throne of Spain. Arguments over the Spanish succession involved most of Europe, and while these were going on, Rook, in charge of a combined Anglo-Dutch fleet, sneaked in and took the rock in 1704, first in the name of the Archduke. The Spanish government of the rock, with the entire population, retired to La Linea and San Roque. By the time Philip V was finally accepted by all as King of Spain, the British were well entrenched in Gibraltar, which became a garrison town, with a civilian population there purely to support and serve the British military. The Treaty of Utrecht confirmed Britain's rights in 1713. Although proving open to various interpretations by those interested in the rock today, the treaty basically ceded ownership of Gibraltar from Spain to Great Britain, and so it has remained ever since. But not without a struggle. Spain made her first attack after the peace treaty signing, a siege in 1727 lasting five months but ending in failure. Not satisfied, they launched themselves once more against the rock's defences in 1779 for a battle that was to last four years and earn the title The Great Siege. With a combination of fire ships, blockades and bombardments, Spain tried to move in, but Governor George Eliot kept his population of nearly 9,000 military and civilians fighting with the help of supply ships that got through from England. The garrison launched a daring night raid and developed new techniques to allow red hotshot, hot potatoes in the slang of the day, to be aimed at the Spanish ships. Work also began on a tunnelling project with the aim of sighting a gun high on the north face of the rock. The only way to get to the notch was through the rock and under Sergeant Major Ince, blasting began. It was soon realised that guns could be placed in the holes blasted out along the main route. An ingenious idea from Lieutenant Curler resulted in a special gun carriage which allowed cannon to be fired downwards at a steep angle from the upper rock to the enemy below. The garrison proved to be as solid as the rock itself and at the end of four years siege was left to rebuild the town and defences and settle into being an important port on the trade route to India. But bickering and battles continued and by the first years of the 19th century the British were fighting off the combined forces of the French and Spanish. Using the rock as a base, the English naval hero, Admiral Horatio Nelson, headed for his last and greatest victory. Sailing through the Straits and north towards Cadiz, he encountered and defeated the combined French and Spanish fleets at the Battle of Trafalgar on October the 21st, 1805, but was himself mortally wounded. Some of his sailors, brought back to the rock for treatment, but who eventually died of their wounds, are buried in the Trafalgar Cemetery. But plague proved a deadlier enemy than either the Battle of Trafalgar or the Great Siege, the latter claiming only 300 lives in four years, while one plague killed 6,000 of the rock's inhabitants in four months, and many of these are also buried in the Trafalgar Cemetery. Politically, things began to settle down. Spain and England became friends, Spanish workers returned, the population increased and rebuilding work began. The rock was declared a colony in 1830 and sense of community began to emerge. It also grew in importance with the enlargement and modernisation of the dockyard at the end of the century. Britain spent £5 million developing a torpedo-proof harbour and preparing a base for the Royal Navy and her largest warships. Work finished in 1907, and seven years later, the rock became the base for supplies and maintenance of the fleet of the First World War. Although the fighting was far away, Gibraltar was a vital cog in the war effort, providing a convoy assembly point and a refuge for repairs and arrival of hospital ships. It was, however, during the Second World Conflict that the rock proved her real strategic importance. 
As 37,000 British and Allied servicemen moved onto the rock, the civilian population was forced to evacuate in 1940. The majority went to Britain, some to Jamaica and Madeira, or to families in Tangier in Spain. Over 25 miles of tunnels were dug through the rock. There were more roads inside the rock than outside. St. Michael's Cave was prepared as an emergency hospital, caverns blasted out for ammunition, water and supply stores. Some of the material cleared by tunnel link was used on the airport extension, needed to take the bomber aircraft for campaigns in the Far and Middle East, and later for the invasion of North Africa. The rock also formed part of an important route for those escaping from Portugal, France and Spain, and was the base for Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa. The enemy subjected Gibraltar to bombing raids, and underwater death charges were laid, or attempted to be laid, on the ships sheltering in the harbour. Hitler had Operation Felix drawn up to invade the rock, but his plans were frustrated. Although peace was declared in 1945, some of Gibraltar's people were not repatriated until six years later. A comprehensive housing plan was needed before the Gibraltarians could be welcomed home, and so building began. It was also a time when the idea of the Gibraltarian citizen became fully established. Although the rock had been inhabited since prehistoric times, it was only in the 18th century that the people who would become the true natives of the rock began to arrive. At first, they were attracted to Gibraltar by the work of servicing the garrison's needs, but slowly the population increased and the colony grew. Jews arrived as traders from Morocco, Genoese to escape the Napoleonic Wars, other British subjects from Malta, some Spanish workers married and stayed, as did a large contingent of British, and more recently shopkeepers and businessmen from the Indian subcontinent, a real melting pot. Of its 30,000 population today, two-thirds are Gibraltarians and 90% Roman Catholic. The language, Janito, is found nowhere else, being a mixture mainly of Spanish and English. For although English may be the official language, the national curriculum is the same as that found in the UK, and the law is based on the British system, the people have strong ties with their neighbours and slip easily between their two languages using whichever suits their purpose best. But that appears to be as far as the allegiance to Spain goes. In the 1967 referendum, over 12,000 voted to remain with Britain, and only 44 would have preferred union with Spain. Their neighbour does not give up. The cannonballs fired now are those made of words, legal motions, United Nations moves and trade sanctions. The most recent of these, known as the 15th Siege, lasted from 1969 to 1985. Political methods not working in Franco's plan to snatch back the rock, he eventually instigated a complete closing of the border with Gibraltar. All movements by air, sea or land were stopped, but to no avail. There were economic problems on both sides of the disputed border and families were split, but nothing changed. In fact, at the time of the Troubles, the UK was in the process of granting Gibraltar a new constitution and from 1969 she had a full internal elected government. And later, in 1981, the UK government declared the people of Gibraltar full-blown British subjects, unlike those in many of her other colonies. A stable population, growing since the 1800s, requires a number of basics. Paramount, perhaps, is a supply of good, clean water. A number of water catchments have been built and 13 reservoirs constructed to replace the reliance on standpipes and bringing in water. The largest catchment covers 34 acres on the east side of the rock and is a landmark for anyone travelling through the strait. But even this great corrugated covered area is becoming redundant with the advent of desalination plants and the sheets are to be removed in the near future. Also changing is Gibraltar's position of importance in the UK's military considerations. But taking the place of that country's service personnel, the British Army moved out in 1991, leaving their duties in the hands of the Gibraltar Regiment, are the forces of NATO. Gibraltar is now an operations centre for this far-reaching military alliance. And deep inside the rock are millions of pounds worth of equipment, visible by the man in the street 
in the aerials and domes perched on the upper rock. So Gibraltar is still of prime strategic importance, and all ship and submarine movements in her strait are controlled and recorded on the battery of equipment inside the rock. As the need for the dockyards and garrison duties have declined over the years, Gibraltar has begun to diversify, developing over the last decade into an international finance centre, and is home to offices of banks from all over Europe and even further afield. To provide more room for all this activity and more housing for the residents, adventurous reclamation schemes have provided the rock with much needed land for expansion, and the west side now boasts the magnificent Europort complex of offices and apartments. Making full use of the water frontage are three pleasure marinas. Yachtsmen on trips back and forth across the Atlantic and north to the UK find the rock, with her well-stocked chandlers and marine services, a perfect stopover. And the four million visitors who cross by land find plenty to fill their days, from the galleries and lookouts at the top of the rock to the beaches at its foot. There are the reminders of her long and stormy past detailed in the fascinating displays and artefacts of the Gibraltar Museum. In the basement of this building are Moorish baths from the 14th century, the finest outside Morocco. From the same period, overlooking town, is the Moorish castle's Tower of Homage, which has stood strong through all of the 15 sieges. Although part of the castle is used as a prison, the rest is open to the general public and has its own historical displays. There are views over the town and across the Bay of Algeciras. For an even broader view of the straits and surrounding countries, a trip on the cable car is a must. The bird's eye view from the top puts much of Gibraltar's history into perspective. On a fine day, you can see forever, or at least to another continent. And on the way down, stop off for an introduction to the Barbary apes. Best not to attempt feeding these, as they have no manners where food is concerned. More athletic visitors join the guided walking tour that takes in St. Michael's Cave. This natural cavern houses the stalactites and stalagmites you might expect, but is also a magnificent amphitheatre and site of many unforgettable musical performances. Still inside the rock are the great siege tunnels on the north side. Recently renovated and improved, they show the great feat of the 18th century engineers who blasted through the limestone. Their story is told with the aid of tableau and life-size models. From the bottom cable car station, it's a short walk up to the Alameda Gardens, acres of beautifully kept trees and plants from the immediate area and further afield. Magnificent dragon trees and palms date from the garden's beginnings in the 1800s, and new beds are being planted and enlarged continually. This quiet oasis provides the ideal place to sit before heading down to Main Street, the shopping heart of Gibraltar. An Aladdin's cave of goodies, from French perfumes to Scotch whiskey and Japanese electronics, it's all there at prices that reflect the fact Jib's import duty is far lower than the UK's, and there's no VAT to pay. Gibraltar's currency is sterling, but it does have its own coinage, which is accepted at exactly the same rate as the UK pound. All major credit cards are accepted. The atmosphere in Gibraltar streets provides for interesting and exciting shopping. Main Street is a landmark in its own right. At the south end is the Trafalgar Cemetery, halfway down the convent, home of the governor. And looking up above the shop windows or down the many alleys, there are fine examples of 15th and 16th century Spanish houses, and the later English Regency style. Fronting Main Street, standing on the site of a mosque, is the Roman Catholic Cathedral of St Mary the Crown, which had to be rebuilt following damage during the Great Siege. The Church of England Cathedral of the Holy Trinity is a slightly later building on a quiet square on the street behind. Back on the main thoroughfare is the Regency Exchange, now home of the Gibraltar House of Assembly, and City Hall, and a very welcome taxi rank. The rock is well served by buses, taxis and tour buses, as its size is deceptive, and to visit all the sites on foot is quite an achievement. Especially if you include a trip to Europa Point on Gibraltar's most southerly point. Here is the Shrine of Our Lady of Europe, 
which after a checkered history, first as a mosque and later a Spanish chapel, is now the scene of many religious pilgrimages to visit the ancient statue. Nearby, the distinctive red and white striped lighthouse, the only one under the control of Trinity House outside the UK, has guarded the strait for a century and a half. Over 2,000 commercial ships pass by here every month, plus fleets of fishing boats and pleasure yachts. And the best way to experience the full grandeur of the rock is from the sea. Day boats run from the marinas, and some offer special trips to view the many schools of dolphins that gather round the bay, especially in the summer. Marina Bay, on the west side, has a number of fine restaurants and bars for relaxing in after wandering along the quays, admiring the large sail and motor yachts moored there. And of course, Gibraltar boasts a number of golden beaches on the east side. Catalan Bay, once the home of the rock's small fishing fleet, is now a popular area for those looking for sun, sand and sea, as our neighbouring Eastern Beach and Sandy Bay. Gibraltar is also an ideal base for exploring both southern Spain and Morocco. There are many organised coach tours from the rock, and the Costa del Sol, the mountain town of Ronda and the Sherry base of Jerez can all be visited on day trips. Regular flights go direct to Tangier, Casablanca and Marrakech, and there's also a ferry to Tangier, making the exotic delights of the African continent only a short step away. So today's tourists can easily travel to the land of some of those original visitors who arrived with Tariq the Moor all those hundreds of years ago to experience the wonders of the rock that is Gibraltar. <laughs>